And what I will say to you is that we're looking to, to, to build on the west side of London a office and I need people to get volunteers to come along to be part of the movement and I'm going to leave it to Nassar and Amrit to speak about what they want to try and do in this area but there's other candidates that they're working with. Rizwana is going to be fighting for us in uh, Hayes and Harlington. So there's a few, I, I don't know the exact people who are going to be but is that George? Yeah. Get in here George. So ladies and gentlemen, you all know our party leader, George Galloway. I'm just going to hand it over and uh, let him talk to you about what he wants to do. How wonderful. <laughs> well, I must say you make me proud. This turnout this evening and that splendid welcome. I'm most grateful to all of you uh, for coming tonight. And for those who organize this, they can definitely count it so far a success. It is not unusual. We had hundreds of people in we had hundreds of people in Blackburn on Saturday. Uh, and something big is happening in this country. There is a united revulsion at the role being played by the political parties in our country and the role being played by our country in the world. This very afternoon, 11 children were murdered in a playground in Gaza, hit by a missile fired by a drone almost certainly a drone partly built here in Britain, by the way, and nobody, I'll guarantee you, will mention it on News at 10 this evening. This has been normalized. The role being played by our political party, because that's what we've got, a political party, not parties. Anyone who's been in the House of Commons or watched it can see that you couldn't slip sixpence between Labour and the Conservative Party on the great issues of the day. Great and small, actually. I've just come from another display of bipartisan government uh, on the uh, rather trivial but Nonetheless, interesting, uh, law that was passed today, or given its second reading today, if any of you are shopkeepers, let me be the first to break the news to you that you will soon have to agree to sell tobacco to a 35-year-old man, but refuse to sell tobacco to a 34-year-old man who will not be allowed to buy tobacco, even though tobacco is legal for a 35-year-old, it will be illegal for a 34-year-old. The man will not be prosecuted. The shopkeeper will be prosecuted. They've carefully avoided losing votes by prosecuting the individuals and put that on the individual shopkeeper. Supported with absolute unanimity between the government and the so-called opposition. But yesterday was a far more important display of this uni-party, these two cheeks of the same backside that I speak about. One of my most famous sayings, actually, because it's so true and so obvious. Yesterday in the House of Commons, 
the Prime Minister, having told us, by the way, he had to hurry up because he had booked a telephone call with Netanyahu, only to discover that Netanyahu was too busy to talk to him on the phone. <laughs> That's how much respect the Israeli state has for Rishi Suna, for Britain, whose pilots were in the air defending Israel just 48 hours or so previously. But Sunak made an entire parliamentary statement in which he did not <coughs> once refer to the fact that the reason for the Iranian attack on Israel at the weekend was that Israel had destroyed their embassy in Damascus two weeks before. I could hardly believe my ears. He wasn't even going to mention it at all. In fact, as I pointed out, not only did he not mention it, Keir Starmer didn't mention it. They were both there for a concert party of condemnation of Iran without even mentioning the crime under international law that Israel had committed on the 1st of April. In fact, again, as I said yesterday in the House, Kay Burley of Sky News was up till then the only person who had raised this matter. But they were there in their mass ranks. Hundreds of Tory MPs, hundreds of Labour MPs, all here, 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 hearing in absolute defiance of two things. First of all, the truth, namely that this had all been caused by Israel bombing a sovereign country's embassy in a third country's capital, but secondly, in absolute defiance of the fact that literally millions of people in this country completely reject Britain's support for the slaughter in Palestine. It's like we don't exist. And for them, we don't exist. But we will exist on the 2nd of May because we've all got a vote. We will exist in the general election, which in my view will come very swiftly after it. We will exist then if we want to, if we decide to. You see, if we decide to go along with them and say, you've ignored us, defied us, carried on your role in the mass murder in Gaza, but we're going to vote for you anyway, well, we deserve what we get. This is a democracy. You, do, you get the government, you vote for. And if that government turns out to be a gang of crooks who've sold their soul and are taking the lives of scores of thousands of children. Children. <clears throat> it's very important to remember that 71% of the people killed in Gaza were either women or children. If you, go, if you vote for that, if you vote to reward the political parties who did that, what does that say about you? What would that say about us as a country? I think there are religious people here. How would you answer that on the judgment day? Yeah. We know what they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We saw what they did. <laughs> and we the anyway, it's a serious point. I, I am a religious man myself. How would I answer that question? What did you do when the children were being massacred? Well, Lord, I voted for the people that were carrying it out, that were making it possible. That wouldn't pa pass much muster on the judgment day. I don't believe. Now, not everybody in here is a religious person. 
Some are from different religions. Let me take it to a different dimension then. We're humans. These children are human children. <clears throat> but for good grace, they could be our children. They look like our children. I have six children. Every time I look at my children, I see the children that I've just been watching on my phone dead, <laughs> mutilated. Anybody who's got children or grandchildren must be thinking the same way. So we exist in the Workers' Party to give the people of this country an opportunity to reject the war criminals, the people responsible for the slaughter of these children. And all the signs are that the British people are now, perhaps suddenly, although it's been accruing over a long period of time, but it looks like suddenly. And this meeting tonight is further evidence of that are determined to break the mold, determined to insist that there is another way, a better way. And that's where we are coming. Most of you know me. It seems from the welcome you gave me that you know me. I've not... Uh, <laughs> I've not just arrived, I've been around a long time, I have a track record, I've opposed all the crimes, all the wars, I've opposed the racists, the people who want to scapegoat migrant communities, ethnic minorities for the problems of the capitalist system and its imperialist superstructure, I've done all that. I didn't arrive yesterday. You know the political record that I have. And this is the party that I lead. We're not only interested in foreign affairs. As a matter of fact, we wish we didn't have to be interested in foreign affairs at all. We'd rather be talking about the poverty, stalking the land, the poverty of our public services, the poverty of our public housing and its shortage. The poverty of our National Health Service, where literally millions of people are on waiting lists and dying on those waiting lists. Are waiting at A&E, sometimes for 24 hours and more. Sometimes dying in A&E. We'd love to be talking about the miserable level standard of living of millions of our people, about the seven million of our children in one of the rich countries of the world living officially under the poverty line. We'd love to be talking about how both Labour and the Conservatives, I'm not even going to mention the Liberal Democrats, they're not even a cheek of that <laughs> backside of the right. We love to be talking about all these things, and we do. We have a manifesto for the general election. We are fighting up and down the country in crucial local election contests. We are the people who stand for decent, honest politics, cleaning out the dens of iniquity that so many of our town halls have become where the councillors feather their own nests, fill their own boots. We are the people who say that Britain deserves better than this. We don't hate Britain. We have no choice but to be here. We are British. We can't live in an imaginary country or in an imaginary time. We're not like some on the left always running down our own country. We believe in our people. We believe we can get out of this. We believe we can and should do better than this. 
But while there's a genocide going on, it's difficult to find bandwidth for anything else. It's difficult when your country is fully supporting a genocide. Sunak said yesterday, when someone asked him about the decision of the International Court of Justice, the highest court in the world, he said that that court action was not helpful. Imagine if you were up before the high court. The, pro the, <laughs> the director of public prosecutions brought you for trial and you told the judge, this is not helpful, this case, you know. <laughs> what kind of defense is that? The highest court in the world has sent Israel for trial on charges of genocide, has decided already that there is a case to answer and that Israel must cease and desist all the things that make it plausibly, their word, guilty of genocide. Israel didn't even reply to the letter. They were given 30 days to implement the court's judgment. They didn't even reply to the letter. They treat international justice, the United Nations, with exactly the contempt they showed Sunak on the telephone yesterday. Sorry, the Prime Minister is too busy to speak to you. That's the place we're in. And here, in this part of West London, as is evident from this meeting today, as is evident from the decision by Councillor Amrit Mann to become the very first Workers' Party of Britain. Yes. In the he, entered, he entered history already. He's the first Workers' Party yes. Councillor, but he will not be the last. He will not be the last. He will be, he'll be joined on May the 2nd by many others who will be further proof that this country has decided it's time for change. It's time for decency and honesty in politics. It's time for a new Britain, for a new role for Britain in the world. A Britain that is not taking orders from the United States of America. A Britain that rejects the idea that we are merely the tail of the American dog of war. A Britain that is going to put Britain first. You know, some people laugh. Some people laugh at, at Trump's line put America first. I wish they would put America first and leave the rest of us alone. <laughs> but we are determined to put Britain first. We don't have money to spend on jets defending Israel from the consequences of its own crimes. We don't have money to be sailing warships all over the world threatening other people in their own place. Britain warned China the other day to stop meddling in the South China Sea. I mean, the clue was in the name. Imagine China warning Britain to stop meddling in the English Channel and you'll get some of the measure of it. We don't have money for these things. We have too much to do here at home. Too many potholes to fill. Too many waiting lists to reduce. Too many schools that need attention. Too many people living and working for poverty wages whose lives to improve. We don't want to see our money 
setting fire to other people's countries, when our own pensioners can't afford to keep themselves warm in the winter time. These are our priorities. And I think most people in Britain concur with them. And now they have a party with one MP and one councillor. In this year, we have to transform that into a huge number of councillors and members of parliament. But can be a part of a hung parliament because we're running hundreds of MP candidates, maybe 500, maybe more. We've got more than 500 people wanting to be candidates. If people vote for them, they will either win or they'll stop Starmer from winning. Yay. 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 That's, our That's our goal. Let's get a hung parliament. I'll put myself forward to be the Prime Minister. <laughs> now we'll be announcing the candidates and their constituencies right after the local elections on the 2nd of May. But I should mention a man who helped me greatly in winning the Rochdale by-election, who helped me settle back into Parliament, and who is a candidate right here in this area in a by-election on the 2nd of May. Please give your support to Theo Dennison. He's a white man, but he's blushing, so he looks <laughs> red. Looks a bit red now. He looks red at the moment. He's a very experienced councillor, not just here in this great city of London but also up where I am in Lancashire. And so the people in his ward will be well served by voting for him, by supporting him. And if they do, they'll give us a second councillor, both of them here in the same local authority. <laughs> so, with your permission, I'll leave it there and take questions. I'm happy to answer anything that you would like to ask me about our policies, about our plans, and I thank you once again for the wonderful welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? If so, hands up. Anyone with a question or comment? Aha, there are a few. Let's start with this gentleman here. Uh, yes, sir. Why are you going to be a candidate in um, Hayden Hallington to confront John McDonald? John McDonald is a friend of Palestine, ever since we know him. So I think you're going to split the vote. Might as well leave John alone, but every, everywhere else as well. And I think um, the, that is on your list of independent candidates that, that uh, please add on a prospective parliamentary candidate Salim, uh, sorry, Sami Habib. Sami Habib was born in Gaza. He is going to stand against genocide James in North Italy. So please don't conflict, don't share the opposition vote by putting one of your workers party there. Speak to Sami and then Discuss it. Otherwise, we're going to defeat the purpose. Can I uh, give you the good news then that Sami Habib is the Workers' Party candidate in his <laughs> case? <laughs> we haven't decided to stand against John McDonald, but here's the problem. If you vote for a Labour MP, you're putting Keir Starmer into 10 Downing Street. 
and I don't want to do that. Well, you say no, but he'll be voting for Keir Starmer to be the Prime Minister because he's a Labour MP. So the best thing he could do, which would definitely avoid us standing there, is to quit the Labour Party now. Yes. 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 Quit the Labour Party now. We have, a, we have a saying. We have a saying. Judge yourself before you are judged. And he should do that, should have done that when the disaster of Keir Starmer became all too clear, all too visible. As I said, we'll announce uh, what we're doing right after the local elections. So you got half of what you asked for. Sami Habib is our candidate in the general election. Next question, is it you, Mark? Did you have a question? There was, a, there was someone around. If we'll take that gentleman. Oh, go ahead, yeah, please. George, who is going to be the candidate in South Town? Well, as I say, we'll do it. We'll tell you everything after the second of May. But if you've got any suggestions, please make them. We have some people here today. We've got oh, these two tables here are all our candidates. That's why they look so splendid, all of them in their suits and boots. Wonderful. These are all our candidates. But the exact placement of who's going where. If you'll forgive me, we'll keep till the 2nd of May. Uh, the gentleman there, then this gentleman. Yeah. George, have you any plan to stand from London rather than North Side? Me, you mean? Yeah. No, I'm uh, hopelessly devoted to Rochdale. Right. Uh, it uh, put me back. <laughs> it put me back in Parliament and by a landslide majority. And I would never leave them. Never, ever leave them. <laughs> Besides, besides, although I don't look it, I'm getting old, uh, and I also have five young children, uh, the youngest of whom is three, so I can't keep going on and on and on. Five more years, and in that five years, we need to build a new leadership, a young leadership, that can take this project on. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Brother George, firstly, um, welcome to Hounslow. Um, Thank you. We, we, it's an absolute pleasure having you here. Thank you. Um, the, the question I was going to come to, first I was going to ask, is that if you can mention this to our people, our youngsters, that the vote is more powerful than what we post on social media, yeah. although it, both things are. Um, that's that. But secondly, in your opinion, how many Close question. How many things? How many people will we have next year in the House of Parliament? In, in terms of I, I, well, it depends entirely on on who votes for us. This kind of event this evening is an indication that there's a big movement, a very big movement, and I'm predicting to you a hung parliament, which means I'm predicting that between us and independents, uh, there will be enough to deprive. Keir Starmer of a majority. Of that, I'm sure. I study local election, by-election results very closely. And none of them, zero of them, show anything remotely resembling the national opinion polls. Because, you know, Bill Shankly, the great Liverpool manager, was somebody said to him once, on paper, Liverpool should win this. He said, unfortunately, football's not played on paper. It's played on grass. Uh, and Elections are played on the streets of individual places, and the outcome is not likely to be the same as the national opinion polls show, based on those by-election results where, well, last Thursday, Labour came seventh in one seat and fifth in the other seat. They came sixth <coughs> against me in the by-election. So uh, the truth is, Labour is unpopular. It's only just marginally less unpopular than Rishi Sunak and the Conservatives. But all the evidence is, if you get a viable alternative, 
uh, like Amrit, for example, <coughs> when you've got a viable alternative, then people go for it. They've got to be viable. They've got to look the part. They've got to seem as if they could do that job. And when you look at today's House of Commons, how good do you need to be? <laughs> I mean, I was looking at them today. I sat through hours of this tobacco bill today. And mainly just to see the quality or lack of it that was on uh, display. You know, I, I first entered Parliament 37 years ago. At that time, there were a hundred men and women of all parties that would make you turn your head in the library corridor if they went <coughs> past you. Uh, that you would stay in your place if they rose to speak. Because you'd want to hear what it was they were going to say. And you could not anticipate what it was that they were going to say. I'm afraid the Parliament... Well, you know Greta Garbo... Somebody said to Greta Garbo, you used to be big in pictures. She said, I'm still big. It's the pictures that got small. <laughs> and that's how I feel in today's House of Commons. I'm just whatever I ever was. <coughs> but the rest are, well, small. But you have a spine. Yeah, I do. Uh, I'm, I'm also responsible for the saying, a spine ran along the benches of the House of Commons looking for a spine to run up. <laughs> you don't find many. Yes. Hi. George, I'm a massive fan of yours. And Thank you. uh, I was just wondering, I'm from East London, so I'm actually not... Uh, Welcome. And uh, there's candidates in East London who are running against the Labour candidates there. They're independent, but I'm just thinking we should like get as many of those guys who probably don't even know about the Workers' Party into the Workers' Party. Yeah, we do. We're here. Oh, you are? Okay. <laughs> you got competition just, now. Uh, <laughs> just taking the words right out of my <laughs> mouth. We, the, this man is the next Member of Parliament for Bethnal Green. Yes. He is <laughs> a he's, uh, he's standing as an independent, but he'll be sitting next to me in the House of Commons after the general election. That I can give you a guarantee at all. Where there are outstanding independents, uh, then we would like to support them. We would like to endorse them. And they even <coughs> run on a joint ticket with us, which is possible, legal. Uh, so Akanji is the perfect example. And I was about to say that before I knew he was in the room. Uh, so we uh, also knew him. Uh, where the Newham Independents have uh, won, I think, two, and now have a third uh, councillor in the Newham Independents group, will, will of course support those. But asking us to support a Labour MP is very, very difficult, because no decent person should now be a Labour MP. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Like Islam. My name's Afia. I'm from Hounslow, Bangladesh. Nice to see you. I was born at Middlesex Hospital, lived in Cranford, which is a stone's throw away from where we are today. And growing up in the 80s during the Intifada years, that was a comment I couldn't get away with, right? Because we were silenced, but we were silenced by the establishment, you know, schools, universities. What we're finding now biggest obstacle in Hounslow is we have all of that to deal with, but in addition to that, our own community leaders, who should be supporting Gaza and Palestine, seem to be not wanting to engage, wanting to platform the Labour MPs and Labour councillors in the borough. So it's really a question to you, how do we overcome the factionalism for Gaza and for Palestine within our own community? I have a very hard line on it. If you're still supporting Labour, you've got blood on your hands. You've got Palestinian blood on your hands. And if you're a community leader supporting Labour, that blood's now on your hands also. And you should be ashamed of yourself. Some rationalize it, you see. They say, well, uh, 
that person got me a, a new car park for the mosque. So a um, new car park for the mosque is more important than those little children with their heads blown off in Gaza? Not for me. Not for me. And I don't think for any decent person that would take that judgment, that decision. If that's the level of their judgment, they're not fit to be community leaders. If they think that it's right to support Labour after all of the last six months, never mind all the other betrayals, the betrayal of Corbyn, uh, the betrayal of the policies on which Labour got its huge vote in 2017 uh, under Corbyn, never mind those. If after the last six months you're still supporting Labour, there's something badly wrong with you. And especially when you've got viable alternatives <coughs> that you can vote for. We'll, we'll take a couple more and then George will work his way around the room, OK? So we'll take this gentleman here because you've been waiting and, and then we'll take another. Hi, George. I have a question. Do we have any chance to have a coalition with the Jimmy in the general election? Uh, yeah, I was sitting next to Jeremy Corbyn for two hours yesterday. You may have seen the pictures on the television. Yeah. Uh, we talk uh, all the time. It's not for me to announce his plans, uh, but I think it's fairly widely known that he doesn't intend to do anything before the general election. Uh, he intends to run for his own seat only uh, and to be re-elected. And of course, we'll... Uh, support him. He's not a Labour MP. You will not be a Labour candidate. And we will, of course, uh, support him. And we hope uh, to cooperate with him. He'll be sitting next to Akanji and me uh, and to love what we stand for. So direct action, uh, where it's helpful to the cause, yes. Uh, where it takes us backwards, no. Uh, we'll take just two more. Uh, gentlemen here. Hello, George. Uh, glad to be here tonight. Um, I've got one question. I, I came across the Workers' Party very late, only last year. And um, I, when I went through the manifesto, I decided that everything there I can't find fault with, but that's the party for me. So I put myself forward, hopefully to be... MP candidate for Ilford South. Uh, I took the view that if David Blunkett can do it, then why not me? Yeah. So what I'd like to know is what advice do you have for people like me who are very new to politics? How can we get the campaign going? What, what do you advise? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, that constituency is a vacancy. Uh, so you consider yourself already on the shortlist. Uh, for, your, for your bravery and, and fortitude. Uh, Ilford North is a different uh, kettle of fish. There are other people in the frame there. We're having talks uh, with them soon uh, and we'll make a judgment uh, on that. When you've got more than 500 applicants and they're all ready to meet their own election expenses, which is a condition. Uh, you can stand everywhere, more or less. You can stand everywhere except the highlands and islands of Scotland and the wilds of North Wales. Certainly, in every urban seat, we hope to have a candidate. Uh, and uh, those candidates can be you, will be you, if you put yourself forward you make your case, if you're persuasive, if you show that you've got the drive, the ambition, uh, the talent uh, to do the job, uh, that could be you. Now, we're not only into elections, by the way. We believe in building a mass movement in this country. Elections in this year are our biggest priority because it's one long year of elections. But we believe in popular power. We believe in community power, of building up bases in every community uh, that will make it possible for our elected members to fulfill their promises and make it impossible for those we haven't yet removed 
to continue their crimes against the people without a punishment. I'll give you an example in my own uh, constituency of Rochdale. Uh, it's not possible to be born in Rochdale unless in a taxi on the way to Oldham because they took the maternity services away. It's not possible to die in Rochdale because they took the A&E away. We've got a hospital which is virtually empty of the vital services that people need. And when I asked, how did this happen? Because it happened before my time, obviously. The answer was that people went along with it. There was no opposition to it. Now, can you imagine if somebody came forward now, when I'm the MP, proposing to commit these crimes against the people? I'd have the whole town on the streets opposing it. They wouldn't dare do it. That's what I mean by popular power. Elections come and go. But in order to make meaningful change in this country, we're going to have to have millions of people behind us and behind our elected members. That's the only way we change this country. Okay. Got it? So, we'll take questions from uh, one more, because uh, there's gentlemen who's had a long time, but before we do that, uh, after this, uh, there's a brief, uh, I think a few press people here that want to interview George, and then we'll work our way around for anybody who wants to take photographs, send well wishes. This gentleman just has one announcement to make about the London branch. Do you want to go ahead, sir? Raj Gill, by the way, one of our Very good yeah. to see you. Right. I think uh, everyone here heard inspirational speech by George. Now, people mentioned John Muldaunt and Jeremy Tobin, both very good friends of mine. <coughs> both I had to uh, get elected each general election. But what we, we are at Sage, as George said, that people need to stand up and be counted. And other thing George have said, we want to build the movement from where Jeremy Corbyn left off. His, his train is stuck at a train station while George Locomotion is going ahead. The Flying Scotsman. Flying Scotsman. <laughs> yeah. So what we want to do, we wanna, I have been given a task of recruiting hundreds of members into the Workers' Party. And I, test that, I take that uh, uh, <coughs> appointment seriously. <coughs> we want to build a party so we can have hundreds of members in West London, in London, so we can support whoever the candidates uh, have been elected or appointed. We want to win. Unless you have that premises that the Workers' Party can go out, campaign, and win then you haven't, in my opinion, got a bottle to take on the labor establishment. What Keir Starmer done to the uh, people in Palestine is a crime. We, he must pay for that crime. <laughs> Whatever the community we are in, we are, I'm a Sikh, and Amrit is also Sikh. <laughs> Uh, and we have got people of Muslim faith, we've got people of Hindu faith, we've got other faiths. Now, everybody understands the word humanity. Only the politicians do not understand. So I urge everyone who's, who's a non-member, before they leave, sign up at the door, and it's only minimum membership, five pound a month. Please sign up. We are gonna work on organizing uh, campaign uh, recruitment teams in each area. We have to build, we have to support Amrit, we have to support other candidates. The only way we're gonna do it, if every one of you become a member. Well, well.
Lovely, thank you. And final question from the gentleman over there who's had his hand up from the start, forgive me. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome to Hansel, George. Thank you. Uh, my name is Awais Malik. Uh, I am a dentist um, and uh, I founded uh, quite a lot of uh, student unions to name the Arab Student Union, the Pakistan Student Union, as well as the South Asian Student Union. We've got chapters in every single uh, university across uh, the country. My question is very much three parts, right? Your uh, point four covers about education, right? So my question to you is, what are we doing about the tuition fees, which have <coughs> tripled 10 years ago, right? And that have led to a high number of people that are graduating now in thousands, and I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of debt, right? Second point is, what are we doing of those people that have graduated, have that debt? Right? And my third point is, how can we as a student union help you out throughout the country and not just a borough where my brother is standing up in? Well, thank you uh, for the opportunity to uh, deal with that. I was a Labour member of Parliament when Tony Blair introduced tuition fees. And I rebelled against it. It was a three-line whip. Uh, disciplined if you didn't support it. And I vividly remember Gordon Brown, the man who sold the gold at the bottom of the market, an economic wizard. I vividly remember Gordon Brown standing at the door of the lobby trying to stop me rebelling. And he said these words, it's only a thousand pounds for God's sake. And I said to him, it's only a thousand pounds now, but once you sacrifice the principle that our people must be educated for free for as far as they can go, the fees can only rise and rise and rise. And that is exactly what has happened. Because, and from, by the way, I never went to university. I left school and became a, a worker in the factory. Michelin tires. I was the only man in Parliament that could make a tire. Most of them <laughs> couldn't even change one. But I could make one. Most of them think Swarfiga is a, a, a Balearic island that you go on holiday. I know it's that green stuff that smells to high heaven, but without which... You can't get your hands clean when you've been working with rubber. So I never benefited from a free education. But Gordon Brown did. Tony Blair did. He went to Oxford University. At my expense, I was paying the taxes that sent him to uh, Oxford University. And my father was paying them. Uh, also, and they got there and then kicked that ladder away from working class people that came after them. That's despicable, dishonest and despicable. We believe in education from the cradle to the grave. We believe in nurseries, in primaries, in secondaries, in polytechnics, in technical colleges and <coughs> in our fine universities. We believe that our language is one of the main assets that we have in the world. Of course, some of it's been bodlerized by the Americans, but it's still our language. And that language and our university base, our medical scientific base, uh, these are all things that have survived the Thatcher uh, Blair onslaught. And we intend to build on them. Uh, we believe in a Britain that makes things, uh, that can do things, not just play with numbers on computers in the city of London, in the casino economy. So students uh, will be better off with us. I'm not promising you that we'll be strong enough to wipe, wipe out the debt of all the people that have got these debts. That would be many tens of billions <coughs> of pounds. But I can tell you that if we have the power to impose it, tuition fees will be banned in this country. In, 
Enjoy your chat amongst yourself. I'm going to do some press work now, if you'll forgive me. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. Right. You want me in a second?